welcome to this webinar. Um, so I will um, give you an introduction to Esperanto metrology. And <clears throat> let me see if I can, yeah, okay. So the outline of my talk, you should see the next slide now, is um, well, I give a short introduction, then I'll explain what the S parameters or scattering parameters are. Um, they're being measured with vector network analyzers, so I uh, should use a few words on those. Then the measurement process is a bit special. And uh, the two last points, which uh, are quite important, are uh, the evaluation of the measurement uncertainty, and then also how uh, we establish traceability to the SI units. So what are S parameters or scattering parameters? They are network parameters. Um, which are the, they're the most common network parameters. I think that's fair to say. Um, they're used to describe um, how a signal propagates through uh, microwave devices, circuits, and networks. And they're frequency domain parameters. They're in particular important uh, in microwave engineering, uh, if you want to characterize, analyze, and also if you want to design RF microwave circuits. In metrology, there are really fundamental quantities in RF microwave. And I think uh, one can say they really play a role in all different types of transition transmission media. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there is many commonalities if we talk about transmission media. Um, but um, there are also certain differences, and I don't, I don't think I can go, you know, in, into all the, the different domains here. Um, first of all, time's too short for that. And second, um, I'm also not an expert in everything. So what I did, I, I looked up in the KCDB how many CMCs are published for S parameters. And as you can see, I mean, I've distinguished here between free space uh, and line-based system, there is no S parameters in free space which are being published in uh, the KCDB. Um, and or there's no CMCs which are published in the KCDB. And um, this is not that they are unimportant there. I mean, it's just that they are often, are they some type of secondary parameter? Um, you know, maybe, somebody measures uh, S parameters with a free space system, then to extract material parameters, and then you have CMCs on material parameters. Or, you know, you, you measure antenna gain and um, you need to make mismatch corrections. And for the mismatch corrections, you also need the S parameters. So they're really fundamental. But in terms of, you know, um, CMC publication, this is mostly, or it's only uh, um, CMCs are available for line-based systems. So that's coaxial waveguide. And also a few one in planar on wave, for on-wave measurements. Um, now the majority is clearly in coaxial and waveguide, and I will also concentrate a bit on that in my talk, because uh, this is also a bit where we have our expertise or where I have my expertise, or my team has my ex has the expertise. Uh, in terms of planar measurements, um, I should say, I mean, it's only a few ones. As you can see, actually, it's only from one NMI up to now, that's PTB, who has even published uh, CMCs for on wafer measurements. But it's clearly so that uh, this is a bit the future, you know? I mean, um, things become smaller and more integrated, and these type of measurements will definitely um, also become more important in the future, and one can expect that there will be more CMCs in the future also. I know there are other labs uh, working in that direction. Um, it's you know, maybe we can have in one of the future webinars, we could have a separate talk on uh, on wafer planar measurements because it's a bit of field of its own with, with its own challenges and problems. Um, and, you know, but then I think it would be better suited to have somebody maybe from NIST, PTB or, or VSL or any other lab. Um, we at Metas here are not really the expert in that field. So I will concentrate a bit on coaxial and maybe to a certain extent also on waveguide. Um, so let me tell you what S parameters are a bit more in details. So they dis describe the reflective and 
transmissive behavior of a network in amplitude and phase. So this is important. So it's a two-dimensional quantity, you know, and this two-dimensional quantity can either be re represented by polar coordinates in amplitude and phase or by Cartesian coordinates as uh, um, <clears throat> complex valued quantities with real and imaginary parts. Um, at the top here, you see a two-port network and um, you see incoming wave and you see outgoing wave. They can either be transmitted or reflected. And in order to describe such a two-port network, you have the two equations here and they can be summarized in such a um, matrix vector um, equation where you basically have on the left side um, the outgoing waves and then here you have in the diagonal you have the reflection coefficients in the off, di off diagonal you have the transmission coefficients and these are basically the incoming waves this way you can um, characterize a two-port network and as i said these are all complex quantities now a few properties of S parameters, obviously they are frequency dependent. They are defined for linear networks. So that means it's for small signals. Um, there is, you know, there is a, a whole different domain of nonlinear measurements. Um, S parameters are not um, suitable for there, but there are, um, you know, there are efforts to extend S parameters for nonlinear measurements. There are, for, there's for example, one proposal um, or X parameters, but I will not talk about those here. Um, S parameters are defined with respect to a reference impedance. Uh, usually this is 50 ohms. Then there can be more than two ports. So uh, quite common are three ports, but uh, you know, there is not really a limit, uh, maybe from the hardware side, yes, but uh, principally um, S, par S parameters can be defined for N port networks. Uh, they can be transformed into other uh, network parameters like T, Z, H, Y, each of them, you know, has its own purpose. Um, S parameters can be cascaded. That's that's really important. So basically you can uh, measure the S parameters of a single component and then you can, can connect the components and you can calculate, um, you know, the basically the, the, the behavior of the entire circuit. And S parameters can be directly measured with vector network analyzers. And that's probably the reason why they are, you know, the most common ones. Before I go to vector network analyzers, maybe a few things about frequency dependence. So S parameters, they are uh, only defined for the fundamental mode of single propagation. Um, <clears throat> so this means that um, you need to avoid higher modes. And um, you can avoid higher modes by, um, you know, staying below frequency limits, which are given by the geometries of the tr transmission lines. Um, but this, on the other hand, makes it necessary, or this has the effect that, you know, there are different connected families with different frequency limits. Um, so for example, for um, broadband coaxial measurements up to um, you know, we have connectors there up to 110 gigahertz up to now, uh, where we have traceability, I should say. Um, but, you know, th there's, so that's a one millimeter connector, but there, there are other types there, like seven millimeter up to 18 gigahertz or 2.4 millimeter up to 50 gigahertz and so on. So there's, there's a whole range of, uh, uh, of families. Um, then for waveguide, um, there you can go up even higher, up to 1.1 terahertz. And um, the difference to coaxial is that this is banded. So you also have a lower frequency limit typically. So for example, here, WR10, this is a waveguide band, which works between 75 and 110 gigahertz. Um, this also means that traceability needs to be established for each connected family separately. And, you know, so if you want to really cover, uh, for example, in coaxial, the entire range up to 110 gigahertz for metrology grade connectors, then um, it's not just um, one connector family. It's maybe five or six connector families where you have to um, establish traceability. 
So vector network analyzers, they are used to measure the S parameters. And on the left side, you can see uh, a legacy instrument. So this is back from 1970 uh, from HP. I'm not sure if it was the first one, but uh, <clears throat> you can see it's really big. It was probably consuming a lot of energy. And uh, obviously this has developed uh, quite a lot. And on the right side, you can see different models from today. So, you know, this is the classical two port vector network analyzer, which you can find in many NMI labs. Um, but, you know, there is also multi-port versions. There is like versions with extenders to go to the higher frequencies. These are, this is like an on wafer probing station where, um, <clears throat> you know, you basically, is an appendix to a VNA to perform uh, these planar measurements I was mentioning. But, you know, there's, there's different form factors. You can get very small uh, VNAs nowadays. I mean, they're typically not used in metrology because they might, they might not provide the accuracy. But anyway, this uh, has widened up quite a bit. So how does a VNA work? Obviously it has a source and it has detectors. Sometimes it has several sources. And an important part is the signal separation because you know you need to somehow separate uh, forward and backward traveling signal. Um, and this is usually being done with direct directional couplers, um, you know, which can distinguish um, the direction of uh, the, the traveling wave. Now, VNAs are quite expensive. Um, they are quite precise, um, but they have some unavoidable systematic errors. And the scheme I'm showing here tries to show that a bit. Um, <clears throat> you know, there is, uh, for example, an error associated with the signal separation. These couplers, they are not perfect in terms of uh, isolation, so there is always leaking um, part of a signal in, which should not be there. Then, you know, you have, um, you saw you have cables, test port cables, um, you know, there's losses on these cables. Also the electrical length uh, might vary of these cables. So this is, you know, the, the reflection tracking, which is being mentioned here. Then you have like, uh, you know, your source might not perfectly be be 50 ohms. So you have uh, multiple reflections. This is called source mismatch. And, um, you know, based on this, you can um, make an error model. And here I'm just showing the one port part. You know, there's also two port defects like crosstalk and load match. Um, so this is basically the, the, the simplest, you know, if you just do a, a one port measurement, a reflection measurement, then you can actually represent these errors in a, such a signal flow graph. So that's a very common method in RF and microwave uh, metrology to um, represent a, a linear network. So, and um, this, you know, here, let me show you, this is basically the mapping of the errors I was just talking about. Um, and from these signal flow graphs, you can actually derive an equation, which then uh, puts the reflection coefficient, the S11 of your, your uh, device on the test, um, in relation to what you actually measure. So, you know, which is being influenced by these error terms here. And this is basically the fundamental in, uh, equation which you will um, use then when you have to perform a VNA calibration and an error correction. Because the measurement uh, sequence is such that uh, before you can measure a DUT, you need to measure a set of known characterized standards. Very often these are open short load uh, for the reflection measurement. Then you use the error model, which I just showed you before, to determine the error coefficients by solving a set of equations. Or if you have maybe more um, standards than needed, then it could also be that you do some uh, regression optimization. And only when you have determined the error coefficients, you measure the DUT. And um, at the end, you correct the measurement of the DUT using the error model and uh, the previously determined error coefficients. Um, so this is, you know, the basic sequence. Um, 
Um, you can see here on the right side, this is uh, a photograph of uh, a typical calibration kit, you know, containing open short loads for, you know, male interfaces and female interfaces. Then there are also different calibration algorithms which can be applied. And I'm not going here uh, into details, but it depends a bit on which calibration standards you're using, what type of transmission media you have, also what type of DUT um, you have. Um, but uh, time is too short to, to get into detail here. And so these were basically the basics, you know, so a bit on uh, how these VNA measurements are done. And I would like to um, say a few things now on measurement uncertainty, because there were quite a bit of advances in uh, that domain. Um, and also about traceability, you know, there has been also quite a bit of progress um, over the last years um, in that domain. So. In general, the evaluation of VNA measurement uncertainties is quite elaborate, and there's three reasons for that. Um, first of all, as I already said, the measurements, they are two-dimensional, and correlations are really important. So you need multivariate methods. You're not dealing with scalars here. Um, then second, there is the multi-step measurement process with calibration and error correction, which I just uh, showed you. So the measurement model is not simple, and uh, I will illustrate that afterwards. And um, third, the measurements and the associated uncertainties, they are frequency dependent. So, and it's quite common that, uh, you know, uh, people measure several hundred frequency points. So at least for metrology, maybe not in other fields, but at least for metrology, that's a relatively large amount of data which has to be processed. And let me just show you how a full measurement model looks like for, and again, we have the simplest case here. It's the one port measurement, the reflection measurement. And I'm showing again a signal flow graph here. Um, now this is, has been, it's, it's basically, you know, the, the basics is the error model, which I showed uh, earlier um, for the VNA calibration. Um, but this has been extended with uh, additional uh, terms, you know, which are representing influence factors. Like, I mean, obviously we have the calibration standards, they are characterized, but they also um, have as uncertainties. Then, you know, there's noise terms, which have an influence on the measurement. There is linearity, there is drift um, over time. And then there is also um, <clears throat> one part is cable and connector. Although this is a bit summarized here, usually, you know, this would be separate in, into cable and connector. But um, to, to keep the equations uh, rather not too long, um, I summarize that here. And if you now derive, a, you know, an equation, which then, you know, is part of your measurement model from the signal flow graph, then you end up, end up with something like it on the, ref, on the right side. So, you know, this is basically what you apply for um, the VNA calibration. So you measure your three standards, then you basically have to solve the three equations um, for your error terms here. And then for the VNA error correction, basically you have to insert uh, the solutions for these error terms down here. And as you can see this uh, already for the simplest case, this is um, already quite a bit of an equation and it probably goes beyond, uh, you know, evaluating here uh, uncertainties by, by hand or, or even in Excel. And I think this was for a long time, this was a bit of a, a problem for the community. And therefore, you know, they were using uh, a simplified uncertainty evaluation, which um, certainly was not like GUM compliant. Um, <clears throat> instead, a method which is called the ripple method was used um, to basically estimate um, residual errors of the VNA of the calibration. 
I'm, I'm not going into detail here how this was done, but what I can say is that it had many shortcomings. So um, there were questionable assumptions of ideality. Uh, the origin of the equations was not so clear. The, they used the standard, so-called airline. I will say more about that later when I talk about traceability, which um, which is unstable. Um, it was an incomplete evaluation of measurement uncertainty. There was no uncertainty in phase. The only magnitude correlations were completely ignored. Um, you didn't really have a proper uncertainty budget at the end. And it also was not really suitable at higher frequencies. So, um, as I, you know, already indicated before, uh, part of the reason why it was done like that was also the lack of software. And this has changed by now. And I think this was uh, a progress um, over the last years that um, there are software tools available nowadays who actually support this uh, type of modeling, which I showed before, not only for one port, but also for multi-port measurements. Um, where you can characterize your um, influences like noise, drift, and so on, and, uh, you know, store them in a database. And then at the end, you know, um, the software supports the uh, measurement uncertainty propagation through uh, the measurement model. Um, I'm aware of two packages which are publicly available. I mean, there are other solutions by NMIs, which, you know, they don't give out, but that is from NISC, there's the microwave uncertainty framework. And uh, from, us, from us at Metas here, there is uh, VNA tools. Um, VNA tools, I don't know much about the uncertainty framework, but I can say that VNA tools is, uh, has a rather wide uh, user base by now, um, so several hundred users, and it's also actively developed further. So this was a game changer, certainly, when uh, software came available. Another thing which was also important in that respect was the rewrite of the Euromet VNA calibration guide, because the old guide, he was promoting the Ripple method I was mentioning before. Um, but we had a European project from 2013 to 2016, and we received some funding to, to basically do a rewrite of uh, that guide. And in the new version, which has been published in 2018, there is now really, you know, this compli com compliant uncertainty evaluation with full modeling and multivariate uncertainty propagation, as it is uh, described in the GUM supplement too. Um, is promoted. We keep the ripple method, um, you know, because there was a bit of a debate, but we, we kept it in there um, because we thought, well, there's still many people using it and maybe we just, you know, we don't want to change much of the procedure, but maybe we can improve the analysis a bit to safeguard against uh, underestimation of uncertainties. Um, and then in this guide, there is many more information um, like additional information on traceability, VNA calibration, VNA verification, characterization of uncertainty contribution, best measurement practice, which is very important, and um, also about uh, S parameter uncertainties. And I think the guide is widely used by NMIs, calibration laboratories, and also in industry. Um, let me just show you one slide here on the importance of correlation. So what we see here is the reflection measurement of an adapter. Um, and what you can see here is um, the blue curve that's, um, so it's it's just a real component we are showing here of, of the reflection coefficient. The blue curve shows basically the measured data. Then the gray uncertainty bar, that's the improved ripple method. Uh, I was mentioning, um, as it is described in, in the VNA guide, and the black line uh, actually shows um, the uncertainty um, based on a, on a full model and on a multivariate evaluation. And what you can clearly see here, um, <clears throat> that, you know, the, the correlation, uh, which is quite strong in this case, it uh, causes a rather strong oscillation in uncertainty. So you have this, you know, like uh, amplifying and and 
also annihilation uh, effects that uh, correlation can have clearly visible here. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, th this is done correctly when you when you use the full modeling and the, mul the multivariate evaluation. Whereas if you do the ripple method, uh, you, you don't see any uh, of su any such behavior. But that's clear because uh, the ripple method doesn't take care um, of correlations at all. Okay, so um, then I, finally, I would like to say a few things about S parameter traceability. So the traceability is uh, basically being established through the calibration standards. Um, uh, you know, sometimes you're asked by customers if you could calibrate their BNA, but that's not the way to go. Uh, so we have to explain them. You have to calibrate your calibration standards and then you have the traceability. But what is the first step? I mean, how do you create your primary standards? And for primary standards, you know, you, you need uh, some which are calculable. So this means pure metallic structure. And, you know, I've listed here um, what's available. Um, so there's first these airlines I was already mentioning before. So it's an air electric transmission line. You can see here a picture. So there's really, it's a it's just a piece of coaxial line and and the inner conductor is separated from the outer conductor basically and the inner conductor is just being held in place um, by the connection um, and then there are the offset uh, and flush shorts so that's basically just a short plane um, with a piece of transmission line of different length in front of it so whereas you know the measurement reference plane is then here the short plane is somewhere here and then there are also offset opens, but I would say this is a bit more experimental and not so well established. Um, so airlines and, and shorts, they are, you know, the, the primary standards which are most often used. And the basic principle is that you calculate the properties of the standards from the dimensions and material properties. You calibrate the VNA with special specialized calibration algorithm, and then you use the calibrated um, VNA to characterize working standards. And that's, you know, how basically you develop the traceability chain. The working standards are then often open short load. <clears throat> so um, like also here, there were, was quite a bit of progress. There is like an old approach, which were entirely based on airline um, measurements and in that case, you know, people just measured the inner and the diameters of the inner and outer conductor of the transmission line part um, of the airline and calculated the electrical impedance with a simple analytical equation. Now, the problem with this is that, um, first of all, the connector was completely ignored in these calculations. Um, and, you know, if you, uh, I'm showing here a, a schematic depiction obviously it's not to scale so the inner uh, part is clearly exaggerated also the connectors are exaggerated but uh, just to illustrate the problem you know basically pe people were just measuring this part and they ignored basically this part here assumed basically that the standard is reflectionless uh, the other problem is that you know um, in order to avoid damage the inner conductor is always a bit shorter than the outer conductor. And so this leaves the gap. And, you know, and this gap, the size of the gap and, and you know, where the, the inner conductor lies is, is a bit arbitrary. So it's, it's basically floating. And this also changes the electrical uh, behavior. So this is not a stable standard. Now, the consequences were, were always that we had inconsistencies between different calibration algorithms. Um, the measurement reference plane, which, you know, is the proper separation between measuring device and device on the test, uh, was not properly defined. These inconsistencies, they are systematic and they are propagated down the traceability chain. And, you know, as one of the consequences, for example, cascading becomes very unreliable. So this has also been improved over uh, the last years and... <clears throat> The way this is done, I'm showing to show this here on one slide, and then I will go a bit more into details on the different aspects. So we have the reference standards here. They are still airline and shorts. 
First, we have a mechanical model, so we need to mechanically parameterize, then we also have the dimensional measurement facilities to make the mechanical measurements. Um, we then use some type of EM calculator to come up with calculated S parameters. In parallel, we also measure the reference standards um, um, to get the raw S parameters. Now you might wonder why why do you need to measure them? Because you already calculated them. So basically already have your uh, traceability. It's traceable to the meter. But I will get to that in a moment. Um, the electrical measurements are important and um, there's a reason for that. And at the end, you do a regression analysis where you basically, um, you know, you, you mix uh, these, uh, the, the raw S parameters and the calculated S parameter to arrive at the final error corrected or optimized S parameters. So the mechanical model is now uh, much more um, detailed than you know what was previously used in the past. You know, people were just uh, characterizing basically this part. Now um, we you know we are also characterizing the connector parts and um, to do that, we, you know, have the models here down for like, this is a connected pair. This here is a female socket. This is a male pin. And you can see this goes quite into detail. I mean, we, we are even looking at chamfers, size of chamfers. Um, and um, this is all being measured. An important uh, concept here is the measurement reference plane, you know, which has to be placed such that um, measuring device and device under test are um, as ideal as possible separated. I mean, you can't make a complete separation that has to do with uh, the features, uh, these uh, coaxial, um, these coaxial connections have, you know, you always have a male pin, which is also sticking um, <clears throat> to the other side. And that's something which can't be avoided. Then, you know, there's different measuring devices which uh, are used. Some of them are quite specialized like air gauging and laser scanner. You typically don't find them in your length laboratory. They're being used to, to measure the transi transmission line parts, the outer conductor and the <clears throat> inner conductor. Then we have some mechanical gauges uh, for, for the pin gap. Um, we also use, uh, you know, our length department um, you know, they have CMMs where they, for example, can measure the features of the connectors. Um, then sometimes also an optical profiler is used to measure surfaces, distances between surfaces. Then, you know, based on that, you have all the numbers, you have your model. So you can basically cal calculate your electrical properties from mechanical data. The software which is being used here and which has been developed is uh, typically a mixture of analytical and numerical um, methods. And <clears throat> ideally, it also allows you to propagate the uncertainties, which you obviously have from uh, your mechanical characterization to the electrical S parameters. So that's how you arrive at these calculated S parameters. Um, it's already quite elaborate to do that, but um, it is, and that's where the electrical measurements come into play. It is difficult to uh, characterize the influence of the material parameters because, um, you know, materials, layers, surface roughness, all this plays a role, you know, and um, it is therefore the way it is generally done nowadays is that the effect of material parameters is basically, um, you know, it's, it's parameterized as empirical functions of frequencies with uh, a few free parameters. Um, and then, you know, because we now have our calculated S parameters still have some free parameter. That's why we use the electrical measurements of the standards to basically fix these parameters in the regression analysis. Now for the electrical measurements, um, you need to um, control the center conductor of your airlines, because as I said before, um, this is um, floating. And the way this is being done is, you know, with a dielectric spacer, um, which also needs to be characterized, although the influence is usually quite small. You can see here the picture, it's hardly visible, but 
the the dark yellow part here is uh, such a such a captain disc uh, which is being used to control the position of of your airline and you know basically make it a stable um, a stable standard. Now another important aspect of is a good measurement practice good control for example here you see a setup where you know cables are controlled the cable movements are controlled um then it's also the sequence of measurements you try to reduce cable movements because any any such movement will also um you know basically have a, an influence on your measurement <clears throat> so it's measurement practice is really important uh in in this business and uh, this is also very much experience based Okay, then finally, um, you know, to get your um, to get your error corrected as parameters, you perform a regression analysis, and that's you know you minimize the difference between the calculated, so that's the ones which were derived from the mechanical model, and the error corrected, so that's the ones which were which are derived from the measurement measured electrically measured as parameters. Um, you. So, you know, based on that, you define a, a objective function, then your three parameters are the VNA error terms um, and these material related parameters I was mentioning before. You measure typically more standards than necessary. So you have an overdetermined situation. Um, you perform the optimization over all frequency points simultaneously, and that's quite computationally quite expensive. Then um, you, at the end, you analyze the residuals and you debug and you know you maybe you start again there's typically several iterations until you get a final result so it's really time consuming just to give you an example here i mean this is an extreme example because it's for s parameters um, for one millimeter connector up to 116.5 gigahertz so there's like seven more than 17,000 free parameters in this uh, optimization um, <clears throat> I mean, we can still do it on a normal computer, um, but it has quite a bit of RAM. Um, there's specialized algorithms and libraries uh, are being used. The calculation time, in this case at least, is up to weeks for, for other connector families which don't go that high in frequency. It maybe can be done in one or two days. Um, at the end, you have like 10 gigabyte of data per calibration kit. And the, deb the debugging is usually um, the most consuming time consuming so this can go weeks or um, we had cases when it went for a month okay so let me that's my final one i think i'm already a bit too long sorry for that um a little summary and just a very very short outlook so i was i hope i was able to show you that there were some major advances in s parameter metrology over I would say the last one or two decades um, and the field has a bit developed from old style engineering and I don't mean that negative because you know the, the, the practical aspects um, in this business are still are very important but um, now I think um, we've also implemented some more modern scientific techniques like, you know, the advanced modeling I was talking about and also, you know, the software to, um, to support these elaborate computations. And I think this progress has really uh, brought improved accuracy to um, S-parameter metrology. You know, there is a better definition of the measurement reference plane, and we also have detailed uncertainty budgets now available. And, <clears throat> you know, that so this allows us to reliably cascade um, individually characterized components. Also, the traceability chain is more reliable. Um, from the uncertainty budget, you, you better can better understand which influences are important in your measurements, and then you can also make specific improvements um to improve the quality of your measurements in terms of trends i mean the trends are always a bit the same in our field higher frequencies more integration more minim minimization and 6g is knocking on the door um, and is actually asking for measurement traceability up to 220 gigahertz or even more um, within europe we have just two projects which will start in 2024 rf 6 g and on micro the first one will 
um, concentrate on connectorized measure measurements like uh, yeah, and this is not only s parameter it is also power for for coaxial um, and on micro this is uh, an on wafer um, project um, <clears throat> And as I said, they, they will start and, you know, 6G is expected to deploy at the beginning of the next decade sometimes. And currently there's a lot of uh, effort in, you know, at the, the like research level and the, the, the measurement uh, equipment companies, they are basically trying to position them as 6G enablers. So there's uh, there's a strong uh, involvement of industry also in these projects. And uh, to close, I'm, I'm showing here on the right side, you know, this is basically a picture of uh, um, a flush short, one millimeter flush short. And what you see here is a human hair. Um, and you can see this is already quite small. So this this one millimeter connector can basically be used up to 110 gigahertz. Now, in these upcoming projects, um, <clears throat> there will be um, connectors introduced 0.8 millimeter and 0.5 millimeter, you know, to um, the 0.5 millimeter should go up to 220 gigahertz or, or even 250 gigahertz. And you can imagine um, this is even smaller than what you see here, and it will be even more delicate to perform these measurements. Okay, with this, uh, I would like to close. Thanks for your attention.